The Making of 253 Matilda Season 3. A Documentary by Ambassador 5. And the Base Computer. And Creator Paul Narum. Wow, what a ride. 31 episodes taking place across a million Earth years, and now it's all told. I've noticed each season starts with a disaster that causes a mystery. Hey Larissa, why don't we... I'm trying. The injector's stuck. Depressurization event. Levels 1 through 6. Emergency hatches. Ceiling. Damn. That's only one level above us. Yeah, it's an easy way to jumpstart the tension. This third season got more complicated with four distinct time periods. Wasn't that risky? There were a lot of things I wanted to explore before wrapping up. I decided to use Tojo to connect most of them. The main setting, the origin story, the future. The big risk was how many actors it takes to populate four different settings. Why is that a risk? Well, first, it's a lot of work to recruit actors, and it doesn't always work out when you're not paying much. But also, every actor represents a potential schedule blocker. One out of 60 people gets sick, and suddenly everything's on hold for months. Fortunately, we escaped any major issues of that sort. Was it really 60 people? 63 human actors. But that wasn't enough to cover all the parts, so there were 12 artificial voices. Four of those playing a couple of Centaurians and a computer and an alien, but the other eight playing human roles. What roles were the hardest to cast? Everything that required special types of voices. The accented roles for episodes 23 and 25, and the old person roles for the finale. Those requirements really narrow the already small pool, and I had to go with bots for a lot of them. Computers are simply better than humans. You should have turned to us first. Uh, uh, Well, I invited all the human cast to participate in this documentary, so let's take a moment to introduce the two who decided to contribute. Hello, I'm Gwyneth Knight, and in Season 3, I got to voice Chief Mechanic Firatojo. If you'd like to learn more about me, visit www.gwenethknight.com or follow me on Facebook at Gwyneth Knight VO. Hi, this is Audrey J. Williams, and I play Emiko Silva. You can find me at ajwmsvoices.com. I really enjoyed playing Emiko and 253 Matilda. We'll hear a little more from them later. We also had a Kickstarter backer who paid for the privilege of being part of this documentary, but unfortunately she hasn't responded to more than a month of trying to get in contact to fulfill that reward. So let me just say thank you to Joanne Phillips for backing 253 Matilda Season 3. If you like 253 Matilda, you'll probably also like Joanne's science fiction audio drama series Everyone's Happy. Also hard sci-fi that'll give you some interesting things to think about. In my personal opinion, it was the best show of 2023. Paul, why did you decide to use Kickstarter, and how did that go? With the huge cast, I figured there'd be a better chance if we could pay them something. I was hoping to build off Season 2's Kickstarter experience and use the show's grown audience to get more backers. But unfortunately, that didn't work out, and we only got nine. Actually, one less than in Season 2. And most of the money was from a couple of actors. It's not ideal when actors have to pay other actors. I was hoping to use larger backer numbers to do some physical rewards, like t-shirts, posters, and CDs. But unfortunately, none of those were ordered, so they never got made. So it goes. At least we raised a good dollar amount. And the main thing was to be able to successfully complete the show. Let's talk character arcs. Of course, the most important character is Ambassador 5, and it was good to hear from an earlier point in his life in Season 3. But there were other characters who evolved too, like Faratojo. When I joined the cast of 253 Matilda, the last thing I expected to happen in my character's story arc was time travel. Another thing that surprised me was that Tojo went from being a lowly mechanic in Season 2 to chief mechanic at the beginning of Season 3 to the mayor of 253 Matilda by the last episode. The most prominent character evolutions are probably Salish Peters and Larissa Flint. We meet Larissa as an 18-year-old at the very start of the first episode, 
and the rest of the show deals with the consequences of what happened to her in that first episode. Her accent is a chance to explore trauma, mental illness, and ethical dilemmas. With Peters, we join him middle-aged as a kind of relatable viewpoint character and follow him all the way to his death. A big focus of the third season is Peter's struggle with dementia and his failing mind. But lots of other characters develop, too. Eva Hernandez grows from a depressed and angry person into a mayor. The ex-mayor has a long journey where he reevaluates himself. Marissa Flint kind of comes full circle back into a caretaker role for her sister by necessity. Dr. Stone evolved over each season and had his past come back to bite him. Detective Seatang matured. Sergei Kuchergan took a dark turn. Everybody's the main character of their own story. There are some big ideas in season three. Let's start with the end of the world. There's multiple ends of worlds. On Matilda, my premise of continual acceleration to near light speed set up the inevitability of a point where there's no more fuel and they can only coast for eternity. From the very start in 2022, I was excited to tell the story of how it would end in perpetual motion and exhaustion of energy. And now, at long last, we're about to turn off our world's engines for the final time. Yet, our journey does not stop today. Rather, today is the day we're forced to accept that our journey cannot ever stop, nor even slow down. In one sense, this is a day of endings, but in another sense, this is just the beginning of our journey through the universe that can never end. After today, we can no longer bind ourselves to this galaxy and will fly off at a tangent into whatever lies beyond. There's also the religious angle. For millennia, we've had doomsday cults, but here we've finally got a doomsday cult that has science on their side. This world is coming to an end. This isn't just faith, it's now fact. Or extraction has ended. Acceleration has ended. The engines are off forever. I feel that when faced with their world winding to a close, a lot of people would be attracted to a cult that embraces it and allows them to look forward to it instead of dreading it. I am the only candidate for mayor who can help you all face the end with dignity. All of them will peddle you the lie that things can go on as they were. I tell you the truth, that this world is ending, and I offer you the choice to be happy and embrace it. I took a minor character from season two, Sergei Kochergan, and had him fall completely under the spell of the Doomers. I never really felt like I belonged anywhere before the Good Shepherd took me in. I was always fluttering from job to job. Now I have a purpose, an important role to play. For the lead Doomer, I needed somebody charismatic enough to win people over, but with creepy cult vibes, and I think Kirsten Greenfield managed to capture that pretty well. The Doomer threat is eventually overcome, and then in the final episode we have the inevitable end as the final generation dies off. I'm the final mayor of this little asteroid world we call 253 Matilda. Because there are only three of us left, and we're old. That was the optimistic version of the end of the world. A controlled drawdown. I considered having it end that way, but wanted to show the value of the legacy they left behind them in a dramatic way, with the descendants of explorers and captives coming to the rescue of their ancestral world. It was also another chance to play around with the weird things that happen with time at that speed. So we ended up with an unending ending, a renewed mission. There was also the end of the world for Earth in episodes 27 and 28. Yes, I set that up with the Fermi's Paradox talk in season 1 and the warning in season 2. I wanted to take the story back to Earth to show what happened and how, and I realized that it'd be a chance to bring back some characters I thought I'd written out. It's kind of a quiet way for Earth to end, isn't it? No battles? If our adversaries are interstellar, that's how it'll be. If they want to destroy us, there's no reason for them to reveal themselves until they've already destroyed us. They could obliterate us with a relativistic kinetic weapon if they fear us, but if they want to take our land and colonize it, then I think a bioweapon is the way to go. 
When people started dying, we thought we just had ourselves another pandemic to deal with. Did anyone ever figure out how the disease started? Traced it to some meteor that exploded over Tokyo. The big brains felt the disease was designed by extraterrestrials as an attack on Earth. Are, Are we, we really doomed? doomed? I'm not convinced that spacefaring life will be hostile or that it'll be seeking new lands to colonize. Given how many worlds are out there, and the likelihood that anyone advanced enough for interstellar travel has control over their reproduction rate. Still, it might be better to err on the side of caution than avoid revealing our location. Like we Centaurians did by using a relay station to convince you we're from the Proxima Centauri system. Yes, you guys practice safe first contact. On Earth, our characters deal with the end of the world in different ways. Dusty is just trying to stay alive and isolated. Our ex-mayor is resigned and wishes Earth's conquerors well. But Juliana Sanders advocates a terrorist campaign against the colonists. Then we hit them where they're soft. Quick strikes. Target one of those homes they're occupying. Kill everybody inside. Repeat again another day. Bleed them until they decide this planet isn't worth the price. Cold-blooded terrorism? As far as the Earth Abides episode, that one was tricky. I could understand both sides of the argument, but my personal feeling is terrorism and violence is never the first choice. So I really identified with the nonviolent approach. That's how I would approach it personally. So I was glad that that was the first option and it didn't result in immediate, uh, let's start fighting. Um, so yay for nonviolence. I thought it was a really good exploration of the different perspectives about how to handle a problem that's a big challenge and a big problem and feels very threatening. We have all kinds of ways to respond to these threats and the characters in Earth Abides did a good job of exploring some of those. The war in Gaza started while I was writing that episode. I saw some parallels between the situation of our characters in episode 28 and Palestinian perspectives on the occupation. How do you deal with an invader who outguns you to the point where traditional warfare is laughably impossible? Do you ignore the enemy's army and attack innocent civilians instead? just because those are the only battles you can hope to win? Does the hope of bleeding them into retreat justify the terrorism against these colonists who've never killed anyone themselves and may actually feel compassionately toward you? Is collective guilt reasonable? Collective punishment has certainly been an issue on both sides of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And how much easier would it be to feel justified in choosing the terrorism approach if you see your enemies unrelatable aliens, in this case, literal aliens. And from the other side, how much killing can the occupier justify for the safety of their colonists? And how much easier would that feel if all the killing could be done painlessly in advance? Yes, there are also parallels with Americans settling the West, and it seemed more plausible for characters to know that history than to remember the Gaza War hundreds of years. So I had them discuss it from that angle. If the Americans had the technology for a genetically engineered virus to empty the West of natives without affecting their own people, I bet some of them would have wanted to use it. You could also compare this with the millions of people who've died in America's war on terror in order to keep Americans feeling safe after terrorists killed a few thousand. And the Bush doctrine of preemptive defense. Are we so different from the aliens who destroy the entire human race to keep their colonists safe preemptively? But my goal with 253 Matilda wasn't to give you the answers to these questions, but just to give you food for thought, to help you think about today's issues from a different perspective, different context, and maybe that'll bring some new insight. Speaking of today's issues, seems like there's a lot of politics in 253 Matilda. In Season 3... Mayor Peters represents the gerontocracy. In American terms, politicians like Trump, Biden, Ronald Reagan, Mitch McConnell. The moment where the mayor falls silent as he's interviewing mission candidates was lifted from a Mitch McConnell press conference around the time I was writing it. Are you related to each other? Husband and wife. Hello? 
Mayor? Hello? Mayor, are you okay? Should I call Dr. Singh back? What? The Doomer leader, Luca Patel, is a sort of populist who takes advantage of senile leadership to gain power, promising a tired and disillusioned electorate an end to their struggles with no regard for long-term consequences. There's been a new wave of those around our world. My second action will be to eliminate all food rationing. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Then there's Eva Hernandez and Chief Lawrence, representing a bitter partisan divide where all attacks are fair game. And winning is the only thing that matters, no matter how you do it, just to keep the other guy out of power. That's rich. Eva Hernandez presenting herself as the picture of stability and reliability. And what do you mean by that? Most everybody knows your story. The outbursts, the weeks you wouldn't report for work, the bipolar diagnosis. I've had that under control with medication for decades. And it's deeply inappropriate for you to make it a campaign issue. That brings us to the subject of mental health. An ongoing topic in all three seasons. Yes. Larissa Flint has the series-long mental health arc. The ex-mayor struggles a bit in the second season. Then Salish Peters in the third season. It's important to humanize the characters. Make them relatable, imperfect people like the rest of us. As soon as I brought in the therapist character in episode 5, I realized that'd be a powerful way to gain insight into the characters and explore the personal impacts of the story's events. It's It's also good good to have representation to show that even people with mental health problems can achieve great things. Yes. Episode 25 takes place in Kulasakarapatanam, India. Any particular reason for that location? I wanted a global flavor, so not just the traditional USA or Russia. China could have worked, but it'd be really hard to explain everybody speaking English in China. And I was writing it around the time of India's moon landing. At first it was going to be in Mumbai, but then I realized that it'd be a really stupid position for a spaceport being on the west coast and by such a major city. Then I considered India's current spaceport, but decided to use their up-and-coming in-development spaceport in Kulasakarapatnam to make it futuristic. The downside was having to learn how to pronounce Kulasakarapatnam, and tracking down actors with Indian accents. Initially, I was hoping to get the correct regional accent, but just getting any kind of Indian accent was hard enough. I ended up using a bot for a couple of the smaller Indian accent roles, but fortunately Gwendolyn Lim stepped up at the last minute to take on the biggest role of Dr. Devi Ramachandran, and I was able to rationalize some foreigners working for the United Nations Space Agency there. Episodes 27 and 28 take place in Placerville, California. We're in a little town called Placerville. Our base of operations right now is the Carey House Hotel. Why this small town? Because I live there, almost. Actually, I live in a much less interesting neighboring town a couple miles from Placerville. I also feel the timeless historical character of Placerville as a town that celebrates its gold rush history makes it easier to anticipate what it'll be like in 2240. I know certain things that won't change, certain buildings that'll still be there. Too much sci-fi seems to have a vision of the future where it seems like every single person of the world is living in a gigantic metropolis. But the reality is not everybody's going to want to live in those gleaming skyscrapers. But mostly it was just a lot of fun to bring the story home and put the characters in places I know well. No funding from the tourism board. Sadly, no. The county does have a film commission, but I'm pretty sure they don't care about audio drama. Episode 28 also goes to Sacramento. Any particular reason? Entirely because I wanted to make reference to Southside Park's quirky alien space fan sculpture. I just noticed the crowd is gathered around an old sculpture of an alien space fan next to a lake. The real aliens admiring the fake aliens. The van's engines light up and there's some aliens on it doing an EVA repair. If any aliens do want to conquer the Earth, all I ask is that they do it there. On the production side, what was the most challenging to make? Episode 22, for sure. Two particular scenes had so many layers to them. The protest scene outside the mayor's office was really tricky. (laughs) 
getting those chants right and the right balance between chaos and audibility. And then the scene in communications where Eckert emerges as the transmission from Carson and Lee plays in the background. And what was your favorite scene? The interrogation scene in episode 25. Listen to my voice. You can hear only my voice. I can only hear your voice. It wasn't necessary to the plot. I just indulged myself and wrote it because I knew I was going to enjoy making it and hearing it so much. It was inspired by a couple of drugged interrogation scenes in the BBC miniseries The Psychedelic Spy and NPR's Star Wars radio drama. Steph Canapa did a great job with the interrogator part. And having an original soundtrack for it made it possible to pull it off properly because the music's really critical there. My favorite episode to record in this season was Earth's Past. It was a lot of work, but I had fun with Tojo, even though she was definitely not having fun on Earth. The part I thought was pretty hilarious in that episode was when Tojo gives Ambassador 8 a rough time about never using contractions. It sounds like something I would say in real life. That was actually me, Ambassador 5, not 8. We aliens all look alike to you, don't we? Let's talk about the science. What a fascinating world. The science behind that, I love time shifting and multidimensional kinds of science stories. So this one was right in my wheelhouse, and it was so much fun to listen to and experience. The science seems softer this season, doesn't it? For sure. The time travel wormhole is the only probably physically impossible element that I threw Technobabble at, though. All the math on completing an orbit of the galaxy and ages and time dilation is at least roughly accurate. The ex-mayor becoming younger than the pen pal who used to be older than him is the classic twin paradox of relativistic travel. And she'd have been as ancient as I am now, by the end. Which is funny, actually, because I used to be older than her. The science behind the primary setting is solid. I did some research into what their sky would look like at these speeds. I want you all to look up at the ceiling down there. This is a live projection of the view from the surface, made to look as if the dome were clear and we could peer directly up into space. Quite a different view from what we older folk remember, isn't it? The sky compressed, the stars we once knew now red shifted or Blue shifted into a beautifully unsettling rainbow. Then there's the empty sky during the intergalactic travel in the final episode. The sky. It's so empty. The idea of being stranded in perpetual motion is a consequence of the science behind their relativistic travel. And there were other bits of hard science slipped in, like the tidally locked exoplanet in episode 22. A lot are unique to the hotter climate. I think the best analogy for this place is Chile. Instead of the Andes Mountains, here it's the fixed daylight terminator that gives us these long vertical lines of unique climates and the ability to traverse such a variety of climates horizontally in a matter of a few hours block. Personally, my sweet spot has the sun slightly below the horizon. We likes it hotter. The thing that's totally different here from Chile is the wind, of course. Around the Terminator, it's always so windy. I tried to keep everything plausible that I could, but I needed the time travel element to take the story to interesting places while keeping a familiar character for the listener to relate with. With the different time periods and locations, you have different levels of technology to explore. That's right. In 2107, holographic tech is still only known to the Centaurians, and they use traditional jail cells without the force fields we hear in 2240. On Earth in 2240, I didn't want to distract too much by talking about the tech, but I made mention of underground transit tunnels and aeroglides. Why did you take us back to 2107? To fully understand the people of 253 Matilda, I think you have to understand where they came from. It also gives the series more re-listenability, I think. Next time you listen to it, you're going to understand things differently because you know their past as well as their future. References to Commander Peters will mean something to you. You'll know why the names are mixed nationalities. News events you'll hear will relate to things from 2107. It just gives you another layer to interpret the series through on your next listen. 
I noticed you don't talk much about the role of artificial intelligence. Well, the series just wasn't about that. Admittedly, when I started writing the first season, AI wasn't a big thing yet. And if I were writing it now, I'd probably involve it in more ways. But I tried to keep it out of the way with just brief mentions like the role in medical analysis. Because this story is about people, even if some of them are being played by AI voices. The final episode plays a bit loose with the science, I think. Wouldn't their thrust be so strong they'd be pancaked? Affirmative. Explanation not available. A bit, because I wanted to convey that sense of the returnees being far more advanced because of how much time had passed for them. But their presence is scientifically reasonable. While a population of two isn't normally enough to grow a sustainable colony, they could have brought along additional genetic samples, and it's already established that they're adept at gene editing, and they can grow babies in artificial wombs. So, no incest required, as long as a few of the expeditions brought along the right equipment. Why did you write the final episode the way you did? Why move it so far into the future? There were really four concluding episodes, each tying up different loose ends. For the final one, I wanted to address the inevitable end. The first episode of the season sets this up with the end of acceleration, and from that point there's a ticking timer to the eventual end of life. So I wanted to hear that end, and to bring Tojo there so that we'd have somebody familiar. I was thinking about the impact their exploration would have had on the galaxy, the possibility that they may even have left behind new civilizations, or that the people taken by the invading asteroid in Season 2 could have started a new human civilization. I realized that no matter how close to the speed of light they're traveling, somebody else who started thousands of years later could catch up by going slightly faster. And what better way to bring home the impact of their legacy than to have the civilization spawned by 253 Matilda come back to revive it? What do you see as the legacy or importance of 253 Matilda? The series, I mean, not the asteroid? It's easy to find optimism in comedic shows. Though not in vogue at the moment, it used to be easy to find optimism in fantasy and soft sci-fi. But I think 253 Matilda is fairly rare in being serious, optimistic realism. It's a future that's not a fantasy, where bad things happen, but where people are basically good, and those who are bad have their reasons, and humanity can ultimately overcome fear and hatred and our negative instincts to achieve amazing things. And I think it's important to inject some of that optimism into our world. We can't overcome our problems if all we can ever visualize in our entertainment is failure and self-destruction. It's not just a technological optimism, but a personal optimism. A bunch of characters go through some serious, severe mental trauma, and I wanted to be real about how it affects them, but still have them come out the other side successfully. Even with death itself, I wanted them to come to terms with it and be okay. And I hope that gives some listeners a little bit of hope in dealing with the problems of their lives. Did the show ever find an audience? Well, it's really hard to track because listeners are split over so many platforms. But Spotify listenership really spiked for the third season. There's about 30 times as many people listening during the third season as there were during the first two seasons. Although that's still a very modest total compared to the popular audio dramas. There's a little over 600 followers of the show on Spotify now. That's probably the best measure. But suffice it to say, I don't think we're even on any of the top 250 lists of American sci-fi podcasts. Who are these listeners? Any demographic trends? They're mostly American men ages 35 to 59. I'm not surprised it doesn't resonate with young people, but I'm a little surprised about the lack of old listeners considering the focus on aging. Maybe they just don't like Spotify and are more likely to listen on the website. It seems a shame to end the show just as the listenership is spiking. Is this really the end for 253 Matilda? I think so. The story is told. I wouldn't totally rule out doing a prequel someday about first contact with the Centaurians and the start of the project. That might make for an interesting, different sort of story, but I don't expect that to happen. Not unless somebody offers me some money or something. So what's next for you, Paul? Well, I just released the 11th episode of my Mining Accident Theater movie riffing series. 
I'll probably make some more 100 second theaters. Maybe another Quiet Please original or recreation. But what I'd really like to try for the first time is a collaboration. So I'll try to find if somebody out there is interested and we can try to find a project of common interest to start. Of course, in a perfect world, I'd find some sort of paid production work. But this is not a perfect world. Indeed. If you'd like to check out my other audio dramas and other projects, go to quietplease.org slash originals. Thank you for listening to 253 Matilda. I hope you enjoyed the audio drama as much as I enjoyed being a part of it. Thank you for your dedication in listening to 253 Matilda. We've come a long way together. Remember, there are no true endings. There's only people doing what they can. <laughs> 